the word you hear that cleanses your mind when your mind has been cleansed your life is holy if you are not taught who christ is you cannot live an effective christian life there is no other honor greater than that of sonship worldliness is the trap that enslaves men to the devil relationship with god is a gift fellowship is a choice the true expression of divine love is forgiveness to others what you pursue is an expression of what you desire therefore holy brethren partakers of the heavenly calling consider the apostle and high priest of our confession christ jesus one more time again therefore holy brethren partakers of the heavenly calling partakers of what partakers of what the heavenly calling hallelujah he said therefore holy brethren partakers of the heavenly calling Consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is our image, is what we should consider when it comes to Christianity. Glory be to God. Somebody say the heavenly calling. Shout it loud and clear. Shout it loud and clear. Now, there's a word he used there which is partakers. Huh? Partaker, which means you are not a spectator. Christianity is a spiritual calling to become a partaker of the character of Christ on the earth realm. Whoever says I'm a Christian, by reason of that confession, is saying that I have become a partaker, not a spectator. No Christian is a spectator. Every Christian must be a partaker, which means you have something to do in Christianity. Are you following me, child of God? So everyone has a role to play. That is why I've always said to you that Christianity has what? Benefits and responsibilities. But it is the fulfillment of your responsibility as a Christian that activates your experience of the profits of Christianity or the benefits of Christianity. In Psalms 103 verse 2 to 3 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. There are benefits in Christianity. But for you to have access to them, you must fulfill your responsibility as a Christian. So it is the fulfillment of your responsibility as a Christian that activates your experience of the benefits of Christianity. So there are people who are Christians, but by reason of their laziness, they are unable to enter into the experience of the power, the glory of Christianity. You must understand that the best thing that has happened to you is that you have become a Christian. But this reality cannot bear fruit in your life unless you commit yourself to fulfilling what is expected of you. Glory be to God. So you must understand that there is a balance in this work of God. There, is, there are things that Jesus has done and there are things that you must do. Hebrews 6 verse 12 says, Let us not be lazy. Let us not be what? Lazy. But let us follow the example of those who through faith and patience have inherited the promise. So, spiritual laziness is a state of existence that hinders your experience of the benefits of Christianity. When you are so lazy in spiritual things, no matter how eager you are, you won't see God. It takes a committed heart in pursuing spiritual things to walk in the reality of God on earth. He says, let us not be lazy. One of the things that you must fight as a Christian is laziness. As you grow up as a child of God, you must constantly understand that there is a place where you must fight what? Laziness. Because laziness will hinder your experience of the benefits of Christ. Let us not be lazy. Let us not be lazy. It's not, Jesus has done his part. 
there is something you must do in order to enjoy that Christianity. Are you following me, child of God? So, we have an advantage in Christ. But until we fulfill our responsibility, we cannot walk in that power. This same kingdom we are part of is the kingdom where Elijah, Abraham, Moses, Paul, Peter, John, they are part of. Look at what they did in this kingdom. So our life cannot be a reproach. When a Christian fulfills his responsibility towards God, his life becomes the envy of the world. It makes that is when people see you, they say this, there is something about your life that makes you an envy in the midst of men, that make people desire to know your God, that make people desire to come close to you because the Bible says in Matthew 5, 14, 15, it says you are the light of the world. Let your light so shine that men will see your light and glorify your Father in heaven. Notice, they are not seeing your Father in heaven, but when they see your light, they can attribute glory to God. In other words, child of God, the glory that God receives on earth is a function of how much light you, you shine. The more you shine, the more God is glorified. The reason why the name of the Lord has not been glorified in your family is because you have not a reason to shine forth. Let your light so shine. That men will see and glorify your father in heaven. So while you are praying, oh Lord, be glorified. God is saying that if it's not true, you, how will I be glorified? Are you following me, child of God? It is an advantage. So there is something that's supposed to be seen in your life that shows the world that you are truly a child of God. It is the testimony of a Christian that validates the reality of the existence of his God in the sight of men. People will not believe in the God you serve because you say it. They will only believe because they see him act in your life. You must come to a place where you understand that your laziness can hinder your family from becoming children of God. There, are, there is a way God shows himself in your life and people around you start believing in your God without you preaching to them. Your character can become a preacher. Remember what I said. You can convert strangers by a message. You only convert your family by the godliness of your character. If they look at you and they do not see a change in your life, there is no possibility for them believing the God you have encountered. You don't go about telling people, I have met God. No. The Bible says when Moses returned from the mountain, when they saw his face, they saw that his face was shining. So the veracity of the dimension of God you have encountered in the secret place is known by the brightness of your face. When people see your life, they should know which God you have met. When people see you act, see you talk, they should know this one. You have met the mighty God. That is why there are, I always say this and I repeat. There are things you must fight in your life because they misrepresent and misinterpret God before men. When a Christian is sick, it makes unbelievers think that God cannot heal. When a Christian is poor, it makes unbelievers think that God cannot bless. So these are things you have to fight because they misrepresent God. I need you to understand this and hear this well today. That this well, we only know God by the dimension of what we reveal of God. The earth will not know God. Jesus said, if you see me, you have seen the Father. If you see Okay, if you see who? So if they see you, who have they seen also? Christ. Which means that your life can either in represent or misrepresent God in the sight of men. That is why Satan attacks men, not God. Because Satan knows that the, the, the identity of God can only be revealed to the world by the character and the occurrences in men. Which means that people, how do you know that God is Jehovah Jireh? It's because of Abraham. If you take away the stories of men in the Bible, you will not know God. 
So the issue is not their story. The issue is the God that showed himself in their story. The reason why some stories were captured in the Bible and others were not captured is because the Bible only captures stories that have the intervention of God in men. Abraham was not the only man in his days, but his story will be captured because he is the only one whose story has the hand of God. There can be 2,000 weddings in Kumba. The only wedding that the Bible will capture is the one in which the Holy Ghost was present. In John 2, it says there was a wedding feast at Cana. That was not the only wedding, but the one in which Jesus was present is the only one that captured the attention of heaven. So when you are reading the stories of Abraham, you are actually reading the story of God. Because the dimensions of God is revealed to the world through the occurrences that happen to men. How do you know that God can give a child to a baron? You will check Sarah. If not of Sarah, we can't be saying it today. How do you know that God can preserve from the fire Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? How do you know that God can preserve you from a lion, Daniel? So when you read the stories of these men, they point you to dimensions of God. Now, when people read your story, what God do they see? Let me say this to you. Your relevance in the kingdom of God is a function of how much God gains expression through you in this world. All of us, we are God's children. But there are some of us who have more relevance before God because our life has become a channel for God to show himself. There are people whose life is a channel for Satan to attack people. But there are people who through their life, thousands of people have known God. That even their stories, their pain, their shame, their disgrace become a testimony that strengthens others. These men are those who are sacrificed to be aligned to God. And because of them, a generation can have hope in God. When people see you, what do they see of God? What does your life show? Be careful. The issue is not about having money. If your possessions in this world do not testify of a dimension of God's grace, then it is known as vanity. Are you following me now? The issue is not having a car. If your car is not bearing testimony of the faithfulness of God, that car is vanity. If your marriage is not bearing testimony of the power of God, that marriage is vanity. So the issue is not having things. The issue is having them in a way that it bears testimony of something. Do you know what is a testimony? A testimony is a proof that Satan lost a battle. Oh God. Satan came to attack your health. When you are standing and saying, great grace, I want to testify, I was sick, now I am healed. You are saying that your body is a proof that God is faithful to heal the sick. And because of your testimony, another person who was sick and about to give up will be strengthened by your testimony because your testimony is a proof that you have overcome by the power of God. So what is your life testifying? You know, when I talk to people, they say, um, <laughs> um, Christianity is in their heart. Uh, those are children. So you see a sister, she will just dress anyhow. My sister, what is your dressing testifying? Because everything of you testifies. When you dress and expose your body, you are testifying that you are under the government of the spirit of lust. That's what happens. So your life is a testimony. But the question is this, what does your life testify, testify about? Which message does your life send forth? So there are some of us here, I'm sorry to say this. <laughs> we have become the reason why our families do not believe in God. Our life is discouraging them. They say, if not so, church day better not go. You must understand the assignment on your shoulder. You are a channel for God to reveal himself to the world. So everything about a man should testify. Now, 
we are now explaining that God has therefore called us to something. He says, partakers of the heavenly calling. It means you have been called. There is something you have to do. When they call you, you respond. There is something that should be done. Now, the question will be first to even explain. How are we called? We are called by the preaching of the gospel. Show me 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 14. To which he called you by our gospel. For the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. To which he did what? He called you by what? <laughs> now look here, look here. To which he called you. So, <laughs> the dimension of the spirit you operate in is a function of the gospel that you received. That is why as a Christian, I say this to you. It's not every pastor you should listen to. To which you were called by our gospel to obtain glory. In other words, the glory you obtain in Christ is a function of the kind of gospel you received. You were called into this realm by our gospel. So every time a man is teaching you the gospel, he calls you into the realm of Christ where he operates. So if somebody tells you, Jesus does not heal the sick, though Jesus can heal the sick, he will never be healed. Because he has brought you into a place where healing is not a possibility. That is why a man of God must preach the gospel as revealed in the scripture and the spirit and not by experience. The fact that you are sick as a pastor does not mean you should preach that God does not heal the sick. Our experience is not a teacher. It is the scripture and the spirit. For the testimony of a man of God to be valid, the scripture and the spirit must agree as one. Which means what I am saying must be from the scripture and the spirit, not my life. Listen to me. I can be poor, yet I come and preach that God will make you rich. Because my life is not the teaching, the word of God is. So I will not hinder you from experiencing dimensions of God because my faith could not usher me there. He says you were called by the gospel. You were brought into that realm. You were summoned into a realm of the spirit by the gospel. So every time you hear a message, you are brought into the life of that message. Luke 5, 17 says, While Jesus was preaching, the power of the Lord was present to heal them. If I teach on healing, what is happening in the spiritual realm? The power to heal comes around. If I teach on favor, the power to see favor is formed in the spirit. So the anointing of Christ is made available in the midst of men by the teaching of the gospel. The kind of anointing you will see. That is why if you need favor, listen to messages where the pastor preach on favor. You can't be needing favor and you're listening to five keys of healing. You are not sick, you need favor. You need to listen to a message that will activate that anointing and also activate your faith. Because every message does two things. Number one, every message activates an anointing. And number two, activates faith. If I am preaching on healing, you will never have faith to be blessed. You will have faith to be healed. So what I am preaching on is what determines the supply of the anointing and the supply of faith to the saints. So if I want to see you rise in greatness, I will preach on greatness. It will make, number one, the anointing to come, and number two, your faith. Because there are two laws for the miraculous, the anointing and faith. For there to be a miracle, two things must happen. There must be a supply of the anointing and a supply of faith. Are you with me, child of God? So you have to ask yourself, what gospel have I believed? Isaiah chapter 53 verse 1 says, Who has believed our report and to whom must the arm of the Lord be revealed? This makes us understand that the dimension of the power 
power of Christ that is revealed to us is a function of the report we have believed. Have you believed the report of God? When we bring the gospel, we are bringing the report of God about the affairs of men. I am coming and I tell you that God says you are the head. You say, man of God, I'm not the head. Mm -hmm. Because you are checking yourself from the eyes of the flesh. Listen to me. Be careful of the gospel you hear. Mm, can I show you something? <laughs> uh, Isaiah chapter 40, 46, um, 49 verse 1. Aratina mandash koparadiga. Elibanda kose. Now, please read. Everybody read. Listen, O coastlands, to me, and take heed, you people from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb, from the matrix of my mother. He has made mention of my name. <laughs> See, Owner. I don't understand nothing. Put your hand on your head. Say, Father, open my head. Listen, listen. He says, the Lord has called me from my mother's womb. He has mentioned my name. Uh -uh. They gave me my name after I left my mother's womb. So which name did God call in my mother's womb? It means my name may not be Kevin. Okay, I got she. The Lord has called my name in my mother's womb. When my mother didn't know whether I am a boy or a girl, God had called me by name. What is the name that God called before I was born? So his name is not Jacob. His name is Israel. Before he was born, God called him Israel. That his mother gave birth to him and called him Jacob. So now, what is the name by which God called you? It is found in the scripture. While you were in your mother's womb, your name was more than a conqueror. Oh, Bakada. While you were in your mother's womb, your name was light of the world. So whether your mother call you Agbo, Ngu, Ngwa, Ebenezer, Atanasius, Ebane, Ngole, it doesn't matter. That name may instead be the reason why you are down. He said, while you were in your mother's womb, I called you by name. So what name is that? The scripture. The scripture contains the only accurate description of your personality and assignment in Christ. So while in your mother's womb, God was saying, more than a conqueror. And every time God says it, I'll jump your mother's womb. Why are they beginning to shake so? I'm answering my name. Like about that. <laughs> the Bible says, And Elizabeth said to Mary, As I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb lived. Oh, Bataka, how can you hear something and your baby leap? Your baby speaks of your destiny. It speaks of your life. It says, when you hear the voice of God, something happens to what is in you. There are people that carry greatness in them. But until they hear the voice of the Lord, the baby cannot leap. So the question is this. Who is it that was in the womb that God knew? Jeremiah, before you were born, I knew you. Who is the you that God knew before this you came here? So this you may not be the real you. This you now is the you that has been structured by the opinions of men, by the experiences of life and by your background. This is not the you. This you you see today is the one that has come forth because of too many problems. But it says in this you there is another you that is the holy you. In Simon, there is Peter. In Abraham, there is Abraham. In Jacob, there is Israel. So I'm asking you again, what is your name in heaven? It's clear. It's in the scripture. Light of the world is my name. More than a conqueror. Overcomer. Apple of the Lord's eye. Oh, Shagabadaya. <laughs> so when we bring the gospel to you the teaching of the gospel is an attempt by God to define men by a spiritual and heavenly perspective when we preach 
We want you to see yourself the way God sees you. That is why I come to preach to you. If you hear a message and it does not change the way you think, it has not helped you at all. We don't say, I, nah, I was blessed. No, it's not about you being blessed. It's if the message has not had an impact on the way you think, it will never have an impact on the way you live. So the, we are called. He said, you were called by my gospel. You were brought into this realm by what I preached to you. You will never listen to a glorious gospel and end up in shame. Never. 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 Unless you didn't believe. When Eve and Adam listened to the teaching of the serpent, they left the Garden of Eden. He, he, he said, eat the fruit. It was a teaching. Be careful today. There are many people, respectfully speaking, who have not been sent by God. Others have been sent by God, but because of immaturity, they have cor or, or greed or, or lost. They have corrupted the gospel to suit them, not to what God is saying. And the danger of this is that when people listen to a corrupted gospel, their life becomes defied on the spot. So you have Christians who are weak, who can't fight the devil, who depend on their pastor for everything. That is not the gospel. I can do all things. The gospel comes to empower everyone. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power. The gospel is not powerful. It is the power of God unto salvation. So when we bring this, oh my God. Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all the world. And the end will come. Oh, yeah, it is the teaching of the gospel that empowers the sons of men to operate in on earth as gods. <laughs> John 10 35. You see, if he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, what made them gods? Because the word of God came to them. Because when you receive the word, you become what the word says. So that teaching, it brings you to a realm where you become, you operate by another dimension of God. So when we teach, it's not to excite you. It's not to entertain you. No, it's to, it's to initiate you. <laughs> yes. Your trouble is that you have overwatched African magic. So when you hear initiate, you are thinking of billionaire's club. <laughs> initiate means giving access into. John 10, 35. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came. So by this gospel, you are brought. The teaching of the gospel is a spiritual strategy to initiate men to the reality of the kingdom of God. If I want to bring you into that kingdom, the only way I will do is to teach you. I cannot lay hands on you and bring you into the kingdom. It must be by the teaching of the gospel. I must teach about Christ. As many as received him and believe in his name, he gave them the power to become sons of God. These are those that listen to the gospel. So, if you, God wants to move you from this earthly realm to a spiritual realm, it's by the teaching of the gospel. John 3, 5 to 8. Unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless a man be born by water and the spirit, he cannot enter. So, gospel is initiation to kingdom. And when you are initiated to God's kingdom... You become a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom. Colossians 1.13 He said, blessed be giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to become partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of God. In other words, it is the gospel of Christ that gives you access to your inheritance preserved for you in the kingdom of God. There are things that belong to you in God but without the gospel, you will not have access to them it is time to sit down and listen to the gospel of christ this is where your inheritance is given to you 
listen to what we preach believe it and receive it acts 20 32 he said i commit you to the lord and to the word of his grace that is able to build you up number one build you up build you up number one build you up number two to give you an inheritance among those sanctified by faith the word of god will build you up then give you an inheritance that's the gospel so the question is this what have you received you will never receive what you have not believed and you will never believe what you don't hear this is why look here the greatest attack today in the church is on pastors let's see Romans chapter 10 verse 13 verse 13 to what? take from verse 13 let me just see for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved verse 14 how then shall they, shall they, shall they call in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Stop. Look at this. He says, he who calls on God's name will be saved. Stop. He said, but how would they be saved if they don't call? How would they call if they don't believe? How would they believe if they don't hear? How would they hear if nobody preaches? So look at the assignment of the pastor. The responsibility of every shepherd is to feed the sheep with the knowledge of God so they can experience grace. When we come to you, it's not to tell you a story. It's that by our teaching, you should or end, have an understanding of God and by that understanding you should enter an experience of that which God has prepared and kept for you lift your hands say in the name of Jesus I receive the gospel of Christ I with me child of God now but let me specify something here 1 Corinthians 15 19 says if it is only in this well that we have hope, then we should be pitied. If it is only where that we have, then we should be. This is the issue. People in ignorance have turned Christianity as a means to have money and worldly things. First Timothy 6 says, these men use godliness as a means to gain. Listen to me. Christianity is not a means to possess the things of the world. It's a strategy to reflect Christ on earth. Don't measure your Christianity by how much money you have. Because they are, they are rich sinners who don't have Christ. If Christianity were to be measured by money, then Christians will not be Christians. Because unbelievers will have more money than us. Don't measure your Christianity by how healthy you are. It is not measured by good health. Christianity is measured by the godliness of your character. That is where you check how Christian you are. It says, if all we hope for is in this world. Bible says, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So it didn't say, unless a man is born again, he cannot marry. So born again is not a requirement to marry. Born again is not a requirement to have a job. No. But born again is the only pathway to have access to the reality of the kingdom of God on earth. The only way. See that? The only way. There is no other way for you to partake of what God has unless you are born again. No, whether your father was the Pope, whether you grew up in church, if you are not born again, you don't belong to Christ and you will end up in the lake of fire with the devil. Whether you are an elder in a church, a deaconess, a pastor, a prophet, no matter the title you call yourself, if you are not born from the Spirit of God, you have no part in the kingdom of God. So it's not about having things. No! Unless a man is born again, he can't enter. He makes you understand that this issue of being born again is about having access to the kingdom of God, not having access to the things of the world. Being born again gives you access to the kingdom of the Lord and not to the treasures of the world. Stop thinking that you are not a good Christian because you are poor. Christianity cannot be measured by money. Never. 
there is nothing material in this world that is pure enough to become an indice to measure Christianity. It doesn't exist. Never do it. I will show you soon how to check it. So we understand from scripture here where he says that if our only hope is in this world, we should be pitied. So Christianity makes you experience heaven on earth and heaven after earth. On earth, you begin to live a heavenly life and after earth, it continues. Don't be deceived though. There is life. The earth is only... Earth is a petrol station where you put fuel to continue your journey. Nobody will stay in the petrol station. Nobody. Nobody. When you leave earth, there are only two places. Either you are going to heaven to be with the Lord or to the lake of hell to go to the lake of fire. So we have an understanding that if I'm a child of God, the greatest privilege I have is that I am a child of God. The greatest privilege that God has given to the sons of men is the one of becoming his children. There's no one better that you can call Jehovah my father. God is the God even of dogs, but he's not their father. To everything that God has created, even Satan, he is his God, but he is not his father. For God to become your father, you must be born again. He said, today I have begotten you and you have become my son. So you become a son when you receive the Holy Spirit. And that's the greatest thing that has happened to your life. Some people are being angry. They say, since I'm, in, since I'm in church, I don't have money. Is money better than sonship? It is carnality that makes Christians despise their position in Christ to pursue the things of the world. The, somebody is angry because he does not have money and you have Christ. Christ in me, the what? The hope of glory. In other words, there is a system by which you can possess all the things of this world. When you understand the mystery of how to walk with Christ. Christ in me. It means everything I need is not in heaven. It's in me. It's in you. And I'll soon show you how to bring it out. Somebody say I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I can't hear you. I am, I am favored. I am, favored. I am lifted. <laughs> Glory be to God. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Stop. To be what? To be conformed. He says, he wants you to be like Christ. Eh? Romans 12, 2. Be not conformed to the world. So, there is a calling. The heavenly calling is the calling of every Christian to be conformed to the image of Christ on earth. Which means every one of us, what we call the heavenly calling means we all must become reflection of the image of Christ on earth. I want to explain now. And there are two aspects of this calling that we have to fuck well to see now. By the grace of God, then we pray. Are you with me? I'm teaching this to you so you can know what you are called into and what you are called for. Amen. So the heavenly calling is the calling to every Christian to be conformed to the image of Christ on earth. Which means that you should come to the place where when they look at your life, it's a proper reflection of Jesus Christ. Are you with me, child of God? So that your life is an ex reflection of him. Number one. The calling unto righteousness. First Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 7. And Isaiah 42 verse 6. Can you read? Read. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Isaiah 42 verse 6. Read. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. Stop. So, number one, Christianity is a calling unto what? 
righteousness. Which means, by reason of being a Christian, you must be holy. Holiness is not an option. It is a must for a Christian. Are you following me, child of God? It's a calling to be what? Holy. Let us see 2 Corinthians 5.21. Read. For he made him who knew no sin to be what? Sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now look at this. Hear me and hear me well. <laughs> Our first calling in Christianity is to become righteous. This is the heavenly calling. Not to become prophets or apostles. So, when you are walking in sin and uncleanness, you have, you have gone astray from the path of righteousness. Our calling is unto what? Righteousness. Holiness. True spiritual growth is measured by the Christ-likeness of the character of a Christian. If you want to know how you are growing, check how your character is becoming in the image of Christ. If you are in church for one, two years and you are still caught up in immorality, caught up in lying, in stealing, in pride, in anger, then you are not growing at all. The testimony of a Christian that pleases God is the godliness of his character, not the possession of material things. You can stand and testify here how much money you made by using anointing oil or anointing water or the prophet prophesied. God is not moved by that. Yes. Until God can check and look that your character is holy before God is happy. There are testimonies that do not please God because the testimony does not reveal his righteousness to men. So God is saying, the kind of testimony that will attract my acceptance is that of a godly character. That since I began coming to church, I've stopped lying. Oh, God will clap. God say, wow, my child is growing. Since I began coming to church, I no longer fornicate. God said, wow, my child is growing. Since I started coming to church, oh, the man of God prayed for me. I have a new car, I have a new house. And the man saying that thing, has a new house and also has a new girlfriend. Has a new house. He's not talking with his wife. But he has a new house. So he's testifying. Great grace. I just made 20 million. And he's not speaking with his wife. Not speaking with his brother. God says you are not growing. You are not growing. Growth is not measured by the abundance of material things. But by the godliness of character. That's how you measure spiritual growth. If it is spiritual growth. If it is spiritual growth, it will be measured not by material things, but by the godliness of your character. This is how you know that you are growing. When your character is becoming more and more like Christ. He said we have been called unto righteousness. He became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, the purpose of Christ in the heart of Christians is that their life should reflect righteousness to the world. So the reason why Jesus is staying in you is that through you, holiness should be seen in this world. The same way evil people carry evil spirit and do evil. We that carry the spirit of God, we should be doing holiness so that through us, our life should be a testimony that God is holy. So there must be forgiveness. There must be love. You can't be a child of God. I have not forgiven your neighbor. I said, Pastor, you don't know what you do for me. No. It may be painful what the person did, but you are called unto righteousness. We are called unto love. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. We are not called to anger. He says, the anger of man does not work out the righteousness of God. James 1.20 We are not called unto bitterness. He says, be careful, lest bitterness grow up and defile many of you. We are not called unto immorality. We are called unto holiness. So immediately your life begins to go in unholiness. It's a sign that you have straight out. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lie. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths 
of righteousness. See where he's guiding me. So if you are walking on the path of sin, God is not the one guiding you. God cannot guide you into marriage by sleeping with a man. It's not God. God does not do that. God cannot guide you to building a house by stealing money from government. It's not God. God cannot guide you into breakthrough by sin. If it is God, it must be holy. He says, for you are righteous in all your ways. What glorifies God in a testimony is that it was achieved by a righteous means. It's not just what you have that makes God happy. It's the way you had it. So when you are saying, I want to thank God, I have a new car. God is checking, what did you do to have that car? So you must come to a place where you understand, as a child of God, you must be holy. Refuse to live in sin. Deny with your whole heart. Fight it. No matter the desire, reject it. Because you are not called unto sin. You are called unto righteousness. The first thing that must be seen in your life. In fact, the major testimony that a man has encountered God is the conversion of his character from worldliness to godliness. The first, you know that you say, I dream, I saw Jesus. And I look at your life, I'm not sure you saw Jesus. Because when you see Jesus, the first fruit, it is humility. There is no pride after those encounters. Any encounter that makes you proud is not God. It is Satan that masqueraded as Christ and came to you. When it is God, we see the fruit of humility and love. There can be so much pride, arrogance in it. It's not God. Everything God does bears the signature of love. If it is God's power, where is the love? The Bible says, even faith walketh through love. So if it's not love, it's not God. Be careful. No matter the temptation to sin, never forget this. Every time you sin, you have denied your heavenly calling. Stand firm in Christ. Every temptation is the devil give you an opportunity to deny your God in words or works. He wants you to say or do something that will be against God. Do you know that every time you sin, you have just come under the power of Satan? Of course. The Bible says, for whom you obey, you have become the slave. If you obey the Holy Ghost, you are a slave. If you obey the desires of your flesh, you are a slave. And the Bible says that he that sins is a slave of sin. So if you must be free from this worldly system, it begins with you saying, I must be holy. It's a choice. You choose to forgive. You choose to love. You choose to be humble. You choose to repent. You choose it. Nobody is forcing you to fornicate. Is that you like it? What keeps a man in the captivity of sin is not the power of sin, but the pleasure he derives from it. You are only there because you still love it. Once you develop a hatred for sin, Bible says in Jude chapter 1, it says, hate even the cloth touched by sin. When you develop a hatred for sin, you will no longer find pleasure in it, and that's how you will shift. But as long as sin is still pleasurable, no matter what we preach, you will stay there. It is not Satan that has kept you in sin. It is your love for it that keeps you there. So you must choose to that and say, no, I can't be here. Listen to me. I cannot be following you up every day and say, don't do this. They are life, oh, it's your life. If you end up in hell, heaven will bear me witness that I preach the truth to you. My, your blood will never be on my head. Because I was not afraid nor ashamed to tell you the true way of Christ. It's a choice. It's a choice not to forgive. It's a choice. It's a choice to hate. It's a choice to be bitter. Because by the sacrifice of Christ, his blood has purchased freedom for man. So whoever stays in captivity does so by choice and not by force. Why don't you forgive? It's choice. You love the feeling of being hungry. It's a choice. You must choose and say, no! Enough is enough. I, can, I am called to walk in righteousness. And this is where your life brings glory to God. And this is a man called Job. And the devil says to God, this man Job, does he love you for nothing? 
let us take all he has and he will curse you. Job lost 10 children in one day. Became sick, but he never denied God. He stayed in righteousness, which means righteousness is not only an option when there is a financial gain in view. It is an option because it has an eternal gain. The, the profit of righteousness is not that it gives you a worldly gain, but that it gives you an eternal gain. That even if on earth you will not be rich, you will not miss heaven. Even if on earth, which I also agree, I will explain. I don't believe you should be poor. You know my belief. But the truth is this. If at the end you don't know how to use the wisdom of Christ to be rich on earth, if you are righteous, you are sure that your eternity is guaranteed. Righteousness that comes from him. So, what do we need to walk in righteousness? Number one, we need to yield to the authority of the Holy Spirit. We need to do what? Or in bracket, simpler, submit to the authority of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.16 he says, if we walk in the spirit, you shall not satisfy the loss of the flesh. If you walk in the spirit, you will not do what? Satisfy the loss. So number one, to walk in righteousness, number one is to do what? Submit to the authority of the Holy Spirit. They call him holy. So it is the spirit that comes to make you holy. So you need to submit to him. He says, walk in the spirit and you will not satisfy the loss of the flesh which means that the reason why we are captured in the things of the flesh is because we walk in the flesh submit to the holy spirit submit to the holy spirit bible says submit to god and resist the devil submit to god first then resist the devil become obedient to god the more you are obedient to the Holy Spirit, the more he sanctifies you. He is the one that makes you holy. Are you a mission of God? So that's the first way. Submit. Submit. Submit to the Holy Spirit. Submit to him. Submit to his power. Submit to him. Submit to his authority. Don't live the way you want to live. Live the way he leads you. For they that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So the Holy Ghost can never lead you to go and fornicate. He can never. He can never lead you to steal. He can never lead you to lie. So when the Bible says he will lead you, means he will lead you into righteousness. When there will be something, there will be an option to lie, he will tell you, don't lie. If you agree with him, you will not lie. There are always two voices when a man is faced with temptation. The voice of the Holy Spirit and the voice of the flesh. Number two, the second way to walk in righteousness is to rely on the grace of God. Rely on what? The grace of God. Romans 6, 12, verse 14. Verse 14 says, And sin will not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, you are under grace. You are under grace. In other words, nobody can resist the desires of sin by the strength of the flesh. You know, you will say like, this year, new year, new fashion. This year, I need lie again. No matter how sincere you are to stop sinning, if you don't receive grace, you can't overcome sin. Because sin is a strong force, stronger than man, because it operates by the flesh. So the grace of God is a divine empowerment that enables man to overcome the desires of sin and the flesh. When So if, for example, you realize that it is hard to forgive, what do you do? Pray for grace to forgive. Learn to turn your weakness to your prayer point. If you realize that you are constantly falling to fornication, take a fast, pray, Father, give me grace to fight fornication. There are people who don't have issue with forgiveness, but they, don't, they have issue with fornication. So each one of us, we need graces in different areas. So you must pray for grace. Pray for grace. Sin will not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, you are under grace. Any area of your life where sin has dominion is the area where grace is not finding expression. So, to take over the area, pray for grace. Don't say, no, from now so, I'm not going to sleep, I'm not going to fornicate again. You can't. You will say it now and do it tomorrow. 
because your flesh is a slave to sin. But the grace of God comes to set you free. So you pray for grace. Father, give me grace not to lie. Give me grace not to fornicate. Give me grace to forgive. Without that grace, that spiritual enablement, it is impossible to walk in righteousness. You can never, no matter your desire and your sincerity, it is beyond the capacity of the flesh to sustain any ability to be holy without God. No man can be holy without grace. So any kind of righteousness you want to develop in your character, you must first of all secure grace. Grace. You pray for it. You demand God. Father, I need grace for this issue. And when the grace is given to you, by that grace, you can handle that problem. Are you following me, child of God? Tell somebody, secure grace. The grace of God. So it is simple now. Any sin that is dominating you now, simple. Go and pray. Father, give me grace. It's very simple prayer. As you pray it consistently, one, two, three, four times, the thing will stop. Sometimes when sin comes after you, it looks as if you cannot stop it and tell you the truth. With the grace of God, a man can easily live beyond every form of sin. No matter the temptation, a man who relies on the grace of God will never fall. David said, no, me, I love God. I can never fornicate. <laughs> Fornication is on the way. Never boast in the flesh. Never look at another when he falls and laugh. You are prophesying your own fall. If you stand, you stand by grace. Never say, hey, look at this sister, she got pregnant. Be careful. You must never forget that what has kept you holy is not your power, it's the grace of God. So when others fall into sin, the Bible says pray for them, don't laugh at them. When you mock those that fall into sin, you provoke God to withdraw grace from you so you too can fall and see how it is. So you never do that. Never mock at others. Even when you see them sinning, pray. He says, if you see your brother committing a sin, pray for him and God will give him life. Not laugh at him. Pray for him. We have lost many brethren in Christ because of this, our demonic accusation character. No, be necessary in the church. See, you don't, go, you don't, you don't, you don't get belay. Hi, hypocrites. Be careful. Listen to me. It is so strange. That it is Bobolo telling Koki that I've tied his neck. When Bobolo, they have tied him from his leg to his neck. Because she fornicated, you are laughing. You that are full of anger and bitterness, you think you are better? So, you are judging people because you are sinning differently, but sin is sin. It is hypocrisy to judge and condemn others for their sin when your own sin still remains. You may not have fornicated, but you have walked in bitterness. Both of you have sinned. So don't think you are, there is no better sinner. There is no good part of evil. My own better. Not lie. Sin and sin. I know that they sin no better. I know that they people there. <laughs> no, 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 no. If you, have not, if you don't fornicate, and you see your brother fornicate, Pray for him that the same grace that strengthens you should strengthen him. Don't laugh at him. Always have this attitude of wherever I am is not my power, it's the grace of God. Because the holiness that is born of the strength of the flesh is a reproach in the sight of God. That is why God removed the law. If the law was perfect, Jesus would not come and die for us. Because the righteousness of the law could not save you can follow all the commandments of Moses and still go to hell. If you don't receive the righteousness of God that is only given through Christ Jesus, your righteousness is fake. So any righteousness that is born of the strength of the flesh is a reproach in the sight of God. God hates it. Because when your righteousness comes from your effort, you have a reason to boast. Say, thank God. Since I'm married, I, I, I never ever cheat from a woman. Not knowing that it is the grace of God that you do not cheat. 
I'll tell you the truth. Sometimes in life, when things happen to others, it is also God telling us to appreciate what he has given to us. Because if they had what you had, they would not have entered where they entered. Wherever you are, the righteousness that is born of the strength of the flesh is a reproach in the sight of God. I keep repeating it so you hear. So you will never wake up one day and think that you are holy because you don't wear short skirt. Are you dreaming? So because you wear long, long kaba, you are holy. The sister that wears short skirt is unholy. What you don't understand is this. A sister may receive Christ and she has become the righteousness of God, yet she's still wearing short skirt. Why? Because her mind has not been transformed. So there is a possibility for the holiness of God to be in your spirit, but because your mind is still worldly, you still act worldly. It does not mean you are a sinner. It means that your mind has not been transformed to become what you are made to be in the spirit. But you can wear a very big kaba and be a witch. Listen to me. Be very careful of any attitude that makes you think that you are holier than others. Be careful. This is how people fall. This is how pride comes. When you feel like you are more holy than that sister, for God to humble you, he will bless her before you. You will see that. See, see me, oh. See all my life. Come give me God is teaching you humility. For you to know that the righteousness that God desires to be born in your life should be the fruit of your yielding to the Spirit. If I stop fornication by myself, it means I don't need God. True or false? It means I don't need Jesus Christ. So he came to die for what? If I have ability to stop lying by myself, then why should I be saved? Jesus should carry his cross and go. So anytime you attempt to be holy by the strength of the flesh you are insulting the sacrifice of Christ you are saying that Jesus died in vain I can be holy without him I can be Jesus carry a cross and go I'm a holy man no be careful be very careful be extremely careful you have to come to the place where you become broken I'm telling you if you are not broken life will break you choose one fast choose one very fast choose to listen to me a righteous man can sin. But righteous men respond to their sin by repentance. For the righteous may fall. Don't you read it? He fell. He said, Lord, forgive me. I, I want to thank God. I am not like these other people. <laughs> you are digging your grave. Never be like that. This should keep you in humility. Because today, I don't know, there is a holiness competition in the church. Where Araki Goba, women who don't wear trousers, think they are more holy than the ones that wear trousers. The ones who don't wear earrings, think they are more holy than the ones who wear earrings. Who, holiness has nothing to do with earrings and trousers. When God said a man shall not wear what belongs to a woman, there were no trousers in those days. Man and woman were wearing kaba. Even Jesus wore a kaba. <laughs> Do you know what God meant there? A man shall not wear what pertains to a woman. Do you know what I was talking about? Do you know what I was talking about? He's talking about homosexuality. When a man goes and does plastic surgery to change his private part, God said, A man shall not do that. That's what he was saying. What pertains to a woman is a private part. He was not dressing. The only thing a woman has, a man cannot have, is their private part. He says, now nah, a man will not go and do anything to take what belongs to a woman. It, he was speaking of plastic surgery, what they call transgender. Today, many men have done plastic surgery to take the private part of women, and women are taking that of men. That is what God was saying, don't do it, it is an abomination. It was not about trousers and skirts. Because in those days, there was no trouser. <laughs> in fact, wait, wait. <laughs> Do you know that it is an abomination for a woman to stand on the altar without wearing a kolang? Yes. It, 
on the altar without wearing Quran in your dress is an abomination. You know so? Do you know who the first one to wear trousers and short nika is Aaron the high priest? God said, when you are going to the altar, wear a short inside. Short or Quran. So no woman, choir member should stand there. You must put Quran under. No, no, God talk, no, even. No, don't look at me like that. It is God. He says, where it, it is God, it is scripture. So, you cannot take dresses to begin to judge and condemn others. But I still say something that if somebody dresses immorally, it is a sign that they are under the economy of the spirit of lust. It's a sign already. If you dress and expose your body, I don't care how you speak in tongues. I know that you are under the spirit of sexual lust. Your appetite for sex is strong. That is why it reflects in the way you dress. <laughs> but my point is this. This does not give us a basis to begin to judge one another. Don't forget that God says he looks at the heart. But what is in your heart will always reflect on your body too at the end of the day. So he says, present your body a living sacrifice, holy and blameless. Present not your heart, your body. So the holiness of your heart must reflect on your body. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What qualifies men to be in the glory is righteousness. Everywhere there is righteousness, there will be glory. So our problem today is this. And this is why when you come in Christ, you have no ability to overcome the curse in your family if you are not walking in righteousness. Why? Because every demonic altar and generational curse feeds on the weaknesses and the sin of a family to be strong. Which means every time people in your family sin, they have given food to the serpent. In Genesis 3, it was a serpent. In the book of Revelation, it came as a dragon. How did he move from a serpent to a dragon? God said to the serpent, you shall feed on dust. And we understand that the flesh is dust. So every time man sins, the devil eats. And when he eats, he becomes stronger. So the more you sin, the more you are feeding that spiritual husband to sleep with you and press you. That is where all the deliverance you do in church does not help you because when we cast him out, you go back and give him food with anger. Every time you don't forgive your brother, he eats and becomes stronger. So the next time he comes, he is stronger than last year. Why? Because you are feeding him with sin, anger, unforgiveness. Oh, listen to me. When you understand spiritual warfare, you will know that righteousness is not an option. You must be holy. No, I see joking now. This way you understand that this is life and death. You, you know the plenty how. Those who are still walking on the pathway of immorality, these are people whose eyes have not been opened to the dangers of hell. He says, for the for the for the house of the harlot is the shortcut to the grave. You need to read the Bible. That fornication is a shortcut to, to hell, the shortcut to the grave. We need to understand how glorious righteousness is. Walking in love, in forgiveness. It may be weakness to men, but it is meekness in the sight of God. That you are holy. People insult you and you stay quiet. That's righteousness. You do not respond by the flesh. You respond by the scripture. I tell you the truth. The Bible says in 1 Peter 3 verse 1. He says, wives... Conduct yourself in a way that if your husband does not believe the gospel, he shall be won over by your character. Don't you read, my dear sister, that your character is preaching more than your papa. That the reason why your husband hates you and your church is because your character is a contradiction of the scripture. Bible. As a child, you began coming to AGM. Let your family be the first to testify that no, you have become honest, humble. Your father will never stop you from going to a church where he can see the fruits in your life. It's impossible. Now, we don't, we don't like fighting. It's impossible. But when he's looking at you, every day you are in church, you come back at 10, you come in the night, I does not see a change. Don't say, no, go again for that church. 
it will come to a point where they feel like it's their trust that make you like that. But if your family can trace that your life began to change from the day you began going to church, they will encourage you to keep going. What testimony is your life bearing? As a wife, if your husband has to testify of your Christianity, what will he say? As a husband, if your wife has to testify of your Christianity, what will she say? As a child, if your father and mother have to testify about your Christianity, what would they say? As a friend, if your friends have to say, I want to talk about your life, what would they say? What is the testimony of your life? This is where we are called. Today, the Lord is speaking to us. He says, come out from uncleanness. Come out from sin. It is possible. Don't live a double life. Don't live a secret life. Where you have to be hiding and watching things on your phone. Why? Why are you stressing yourself? Where you have to wait for people to sleep, you go and watch things on the TV. Why, why a double life? Why should you be watching pictures of naked people? Why should you be gossiping? Why are you living a life that you yourself are not proud of? That if your life should be broadcasted on the screen, you will not accept. Why are you living a secret life which you cannot, you cannot recommend publicly? Why are you living two life? That the you we see now in church is not the you that a boy knows if you are going in the night. Why double life? Why are you living a life that you cannot defend publicly? It's time to cut off. I'm telling you the truth, this thing of Christianity, if you are still concerned about what people think of you, you are not ready to follow Christ. What will my friends say? To help you what they will say, what matters is what God says. Cut off from people and, and relationships that only make you gravitate towards sin. You don't need them in your life. They may be good friends, but once you have become a child of God, any relationship that does not bring you into a state of godliness is no longer accepted. This is what it means to, unless a man leave his father and mother, it means unless a man separate from whoever does not want him to follow Christ, he cannot have his crown in Christ, in Christianity. You can't have it both ways. You can't hold Christ and hold fornication. You can't hold Christ and hold forgiveness. You must leave one. The heart of man was structured in a way that only one person can stay there at a the time. Either Jesus is in your heart or anger is in your heart. When anger comes, Jesus will shift and go in. So much unforgiveness. So much bitterness. That people leave a church, they stop talking to their pastor. I don't know. Look at the kind of bitterness that has crept into the church. That somebody can be worshipping here. When he leaves this church, he stops talking to all of us. I don't understand. Were we serving Satan? Changing church doesn't mean you have changed kingdom. There's nothing wrong with that. God can lead you to another church. There's no issue with that. But when you see people, they can no longer speak. They cannot even pass for visit. It shows that it was born of bitterness. The strife in the church. Competition. Jealousy. is because we have all lost the value of righteousness. We have forgotten that the man's life does not consist of the abundance of the things he has. What is the testimony of your character? Rise to your feet.